Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 58, verses 1 through 12. Shout out, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me, and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness, and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments, they delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interests on your fast day, and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn. And your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of evil. If you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to live in. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. This passage from Isaiah uh, is um, one of the more straightforward in the Bible, uh, to be honest with you. It's um, one of the more uh, just kind of honest, straightforward, no-nonsense, cut right to the quick passages of Scripture Maybe in the whole of, script, the, whole of the Bible. Uh, I'm not sure about that statement. That may be preacher hyperbole, but still. Um, it, it's a straightforward passage. And yet, uh, as, as a preacher, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't attempt to take a straightforward piece of Scripture and talk to you about it for a few minutes, at least. Uh, and so, uh, I want us to look at this passage from Isaiah uh, a little closer. I think this passage from Isaiah could be described... Uh, as a classic preaching to the choir moment, at least at the beginning. When I hear the phrase preaching to the choir, I always think about preaching about the necessity of being present in worship, which when you're preaching about the necessity of being present in worship to those who are present in worship, the majority of ones who are there to hear it probably aren't the ones that really need to. Uh, and so thus the preaching to the choir kind of image. But in this case, at the beginning of this passage from Isaiah, it seems like Isaiah is preaching to the choir because right after God has charged the prophet with telling the people about their rebellion and sins, God speaks to Isaiah and says, sound your voice like a trumpet, shout out, tell them about their rebellions and their sins. Then goes, God goes on to describe how every day Every day, the people seek God and delight to know God's ways. Think about that for a minute. God announces to Isaiah, go forth from here, shout out, use your voice like a trumpet, tell the people how sinful they are. Tell the people about their rebellion from their God. 
And then the first thing he says in laying out the charge is, this people come to worship every day. They seek my ways. They want to get close to me. They seek righteous judgments from me. It doesn't quite fit. It doesn't quite fit. Do you see God's announcement of rebellion and sin that God charges Isaiah with is that God's people are reliable in their worship and devotion to God. That's a part of God's charge against them. God's people are reliable in their worship and devotion to God, but God goes on to say that they do not practice righteousness. And they forsake the ordinances of God. They do not practice righteousness and they forsake the ordinance of God. They're faithful in their fasting. They're faithful in their worship. They draw near to God. They want to know what's on God's heart. But they are not faithful in practicing righteousness and practicing the ordinances of God. And God lays that as a charge against them on the lips of Isaiah. God, through Isaiah, basically looks out at the gathered congregation and says, I'm preaching to the choir because they need to hear this message. Those who are most faithful in their religious practice and observance have missed the point, God says. They can invoke memorized scripture. They can pray with grandeur. They never miss worship. They never miss Sunday school. They come to all the fellowship meals and events and join all the Bible studies and small group opportunities, but they still don't see or hear or do what God requires. For the people in Isaiah's day, the big thing was fasting. They fasted in order to gain favor with God. They fasted in order to tell God that they were ready to hear, that they were ready for God to act on their behalf, that they were ready to be in God's presence. They fasted as their primary way of trying to get God's attention. But I think for us, we could substitute worship for fast. So that when we hear about the ancient Israelites complaining to God that they fast, but God doesn't see it, God doesn't notice, we can hear that we, they, complain to God that they worship, but God doesn't see it, God doesn't notice. But when they counter God with this, we fast, but you don't see, you don't notice, God has a rebuttal. God says the problem isn't that God doesn't notice. It's that God notices too much. God says the problem isn't that I don't see you fasting. The problem is I see everything else that you do. God says they fast for their own interests and oppress the workers. They fast in order to be able to take a load off and let somebody else do the work for them. Do you know that Sunday lunch is the worst shift for tips all week for servers in restaurants? Do you know that? Has been for a long time. Church people get out of church They go to the restaurant, they have their Sunday lunch that they don't want to have to cook themselves, and then they walk out without leaving a tip. Because that server that's there is there to serve them on their Sabbath rest, worship day. That's oppressing the worker. A standard tip for adequate service is 20%, by the way. Just... As somebody who's worked in a restaurant before, whose brother managed a restaurant for a while, that's the standard tip for average service is 20%. Then God goes on to say that they fast and quarrel and fight on their fast days. They use their fasting, their 
worshipfulness. They're drawing near to God as a reason to pick a fight with their brothers and sisters, with the people next door, with the ones with whom they are fasting. You know, there's a reason that church people are known for fighting over carpet color. Y'all ever heard that before? It's kind of the standard joke about a church meeting, about a church fight. You know, we'll sit around and fight over what color the carpet should be next time. It's a little quarrelsome, don't you think? We come to worship, we stake our claim to the sanctuary, we stake our claim to this place, and then we fight over all the things that happen in it. God says, I see, I notice, I haven't missed the fact that you're at worship, I haven't missed the fact that you are fasting, I see, I notice, but I see even more than just that. And God says, that is not the fast that I choose, that is not the worship God chooses. God does not want us to worship so that we can be appropriately humbled and adoring and dressed up and proper in God's presence. That's not the reason God has us to be here. God does not want us to worship so that God will do things we want God to do because of our humility and adoration. That is not what worship is. It's not who God is. Worship, according to God and Isaiah, leads to and is acts of justice and liberation in this world. It leads to and is feeding the hungry by sharing what you have with them. It leads to and is putting a roof over the head of the homeless by sacrificing your comfort and distance from them. It leads to and is making sure those without adequate resources to care for their basic needs are covered. It leads to and is stepping up to be the one, to be the ones who take responsibility for the issues and deficiencies in our community, in our country, and in our world. That is what true worship of God is and what it leads to. It's at this point that I have to point something out about the nature and content of our typical discourse around how to adequately deal with the issues and deficiencies in our community, country, and world. Because that's a hot topic right now. What's the best way to take care of all this mess that's happening in the world? To me, it typically goes something like this. In order to create change that we can believe in, the government has to get bigger and to do more for the least, the last, and the lost. Because otherwise, they will continue to suffer. And then from the other side of the aisle, no, 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 no. In order to make America great again, we have to have smaller government that protects traditional Christian values and let the private sector and the free market lift everyone up as the economy grows and gets better. As you can probably imagine, the conversation continues eternally, incessantly, and divisively from there. But you know what I don't hear in there on either side? You know what I don't hear in there on either side in that typical discourse around how to do anything positive in this world, around how to make a difference, around how to change things? A role for the church. The role of the church. I don't hear that in there, do you? And it occurs to me that if the church worships the way God intends in a worship a worship that leads to and is our caring for the poor, our caring for those in need, our caring for those who don't have everything that they should have, for our being the ones who step up to do something about the deficiencies and shortcomings in this world. If the church worships the way God intends, we might not have to have so many groups, governments, and individuals clamoring to fill the void where the church should be. Isaiah puts it this way in our passage. This is from the last half of verse 9 and verse 10. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, 
Then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom be like the noonday. But notice here, notice that when we remove the yoke from among us, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil against one another, against the other, we offer our food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted. Notice that it is our light that shines in the darkness. Our gloom becomes like the noonday. The people of God, the church, are the ones with the responsibility for actively showing the world the kingdom of God and what God is doing, what God has been doing and what God will continue to do when we faithfully work with God. And as God works on and with us, we are the ones with that responsibility. We are the ones who are supposed to have the initiative to transform the world. It's in our mission statement as St. John's United Methodist Church to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And in the Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church, it goes on to say that the primary place where the transformation takes place is the local church. It's the local church. That's where the transformation of the world primarily takes place. That's what we believe about this world. That's what we believe about the church, that the transformation of the world starts here with us. And when we worship fully, when we are fully the people of God, the way God intends us to be, we can be sure that God is with us because God will have been bear, we will have been bearers of God to the ones in, with, and through whom we met and served God. It's a little convoluted. We know God will be with us because we will have taken God into the world, and when we got there, we will have realized that we met God in the people we went to serve. That our light will shine in the darkness. Our gloom will be like the noonday, that the world will see and know that we are working to transform it, and they'll want to join in to be a part of God's kingdom instead of the kingdoms of the world. They'll want to be a part of what God is doing rather than what some politician is doing or rather than what some party is doing or rather than what some who cares is doing. Because compared to what God is doing, everything else is who cares. We are called to worship, not just to gather in this place and sing songs and pray prayers and hear a sermon and then go home and have our life be exactly the same. That's not worship. That's not worship. We just heard from Isaiah that that's not worship. We gather in this place and we sing songs to God. We pray together for one another. We hear the word of God proclaimed. We're going to gather at the table of God and dine with Christ in just a second. And we do all of those things so that we will be transformed so that through the power of the Holy Spirit coming into us, by opening ourselves up to what God is doing, we can go out into the world to be the agents of change. We can go out into the world to make things great again. We can be the ones who go out there to transform the world. One relationship, one act of kindness, one act of compassion, one act of grace, one act of mercy at a time. That is who we are. That is what worship is supposed to be. That's how we're supposed to be. So this day we do get to come to God's table. We get to come to God's table this morning and dine with Christ and this table, it's a part of our worship. It's a place we come to have communion, to have holy Eucharist. But more than anything else, this table shows us what reconciliation looks like. 
This table shows us what it means to be reconciled to someone who by all rights should want to have nothing to do with us. Because this table represents God emptying God's self, becoming a human being, living among us, dying for us in our sinfulness, in our brokenness, in all the ways that we don't deserve God, dying for us and being raised to new life so that we can have relationship with God no matter what, over and over again, always coming back, always coming to receive God's grace. That's what reconciliation looks like. Somebody reaching out, extending the olive branch, making room for someone with whom they disagree, they don't like, that doesn't deserve the second chance. So when we come to this table, we don't just come to taste and see that the Lord is good. We come to taste and see that the Lord is good and go out and tell everybody about it. Go out and be agents of reconciliation. Go out and be agents of grace and love in the world. We come to be transformed by the body and blood of Christ. To be the body of Christ. Transformed by Christ's blood. We join together on page 13 in the hymn.